Tonight I'm actually going to do a video of a real USMC Inertal sniper rifle. Um, I'm actually Corporal Norton on the forums. Um, I've been researching these rifles for, I don't know, seven or eight years. Um, I actually started because of this rifle. Uh, I've been collecting Marine Corps rifles for about 20 years. I actually went to a show, saw this saying there. Uh, didn't have a scope on it, you know, of course. Um, but looking at it, I really didn't have an idea of what a real rifle was. Uh, just because everything was so secretive. And then there was so much contradicting info on these rifles at that time. Um, but just looking at it, I sort of had a gut feeling it might be real. So I took a chance on it. Um, I didn't pay... A, high price for it or anything i mean i paid a fair price that if it turned out to be a clone i would make my money back um but just my gut told me this was a real rifle i came home took pictures of it put it up online half the experts said it was real half of them said it was fake uh, when i started to ask them why they felt that way i started to realize that uh, many of these guys really didn't understand why they even felt that way or what they said didn't really make sense. Uh, so actually that's what got me started on researching these rifles uh, and I now have documented uh, about 35 of them um, and then also found a considerable amount of fakes. Um, we actually went back to the archives uh, and found a substantial amount of documentation on these rifles. Uh, for instance, the, probably the best book at this point right now is Peter Sinich's Scout Sniper book. Uh, Peter wrote his book on about 50, maybe 75 pages that Frank Mallory had found in the archives, and uh, that's what he wrote his book on. Uh, thanks to Tim Plowman, uh, Andrew Stolinski, uh, you know, and then myself has also went to the archives and spent a considerable amount of time there. We now have upwards of, I don't even know how many thousands of pages on, uh, not only these rifles, but just sniper rifles in general. Um, I actually have documents on sniper rifles all the way from 1900 to, uh, basically about 1968 is I think when my documentation stops. And unfortunately, a lot of what the documents state contradicts what it says in the book. Uh, so if you pick up any of the books that are out there as of right now, uh, take them with a grain of salt. Um, I, I won't name names or anything, but some of the rifles that are in these books, they're, you know, uh, shown as being real are not. Uh, they are not in any way, shape, or form. Uh, finding the team documents uh, that Tim Plowman found is what really sat there and helped uh, document what these rifles were. Um, they actually all started out as national match rifles. Uh, they sit there and say in the books that they ran out of national match rifles early on and they switched to standard rifles. That is the biggest load of crap. Uh, it didn't happen. Uh, when you actually get into the documents of it, uh, it really looks like there was only maybe possibly 250 made. Uh, there for sure was only 250 shipped to the Pacific, uh, and they started out with 1,047 rifles of national match to convert into snipers. So when you read the documents, uh, it looks like they converted 250, and at the end of the war, there was still roughly 800 that were in the Philadelphia Depot uh, that were not uh, either converted or were not converted. It doesn't really give a specific number on how many were converted. Uh, but when you add the 800 that were in the depot in 1945, and it says clearly not all were converted, and then the 250 that went to the Pacific, that, that is your 1,047 that they started the war with. Uh, they actually started uh, doing the idea of these rifles in 1940. Uh, gunner, there was a gunner named Calvin uh, Lloyd, and then um, a Marine uh, uh, by the name of Van Orden. Uh, and it was Gunner Lloyd and uh, uh, I can't remember if he was a captain at the time, Van Orden. Uh, I had to look that up again. I'm rusty on that. But Van Orden and Lloyd actually were the ones who did the 1940 sniper trials. Uh, they actually sit there and bought a bunch of different commercial type scopes like uh, the Lyman Jr. Target and the Weaver 330. Uh, the Nurdle 8X was in there. Uh, 
think the Lyman 5A, uh, there's just a few of those type. Um, and they tried different combinations of rifles. They tried uh, the O3 that had been sporterized. Uh, they tried, you know, uh, an O3 with a heavy barrel. Um, they tried uh, the Winchester Model 70 uh, with a target barrel and target stock. And at the end, they sat there and said that the best sniper rifle uh, would be the Winchester Model 70 in a target configuration with a target stock, heavy barrel, and then the Winchester, or I'm sorry, the uh, Inertal 8 power scope. Uh, but they said a second, uh, the second runner-up would be if they took the national match rifles like this and basically sporterized them. They, they would put like an M2 stock, like an M222 stock on them, uh, and they would sit there and use those. Uh, headquarters Marine Corps sit there and looked at their recommendations, thought that there really was not that much difference between the Model 70 and the National Match 03s that they had. It really wasn't they were trying to save money. They just really didn't see a big substantial difference on why they needed to buy new rifles and then what had to buy all new parts. And they really hadn't tested Model 70s, you know, where, you know, the 03 had been tested. They already had them. Uh, they knew how accurate they were. And they knew with just a little bit of modification, they could sit there and use those. Uh, like I said earlier, all of them were national matches. There's no exceptions. Uh, they were all the Marine Corps team rifles. Uh, there was actually two types of Marine Corps type uh, rifles that were used in the, the changeover. Uh, first was the actual, what they labeled as the national match. The other was the special target. This one in front of you right here is a special target, though I do have a second in rifle that's actually the national match. The only difference between them is the Marine Corps would get new uh, national match rifles every so often for their team. They would use them in competition, and once the barrels were, you know, the light past their life expectancy, which in some documents it details up to a thousand rounds, and then after a thousand rounds they didn't want to use them in competition anymore. They would send them back to, at the end of each season to the Philadelphia Depot. And if they needed a new barrel, the Marines would rebarrel them with a standard barrel. They didn't use uh, a star gauged barrel. Uh, the Marines had their own star gauging tool that they bought in 1928 that they could use. So a Marine Corps replaced barrel on one of these inertal rifles will not have uh, a star mark at the muzzle and a star register number underneath the handguard. Uh, I see a lot of real inertal snipers that someone has added a fake star stamp on the muzzle because some book told them that's what they had to have. And that's unfortunate about this is I've seen real rifles uh, that they sit there and change features on because of what a book says. Same thing goes for uh, sights. I've seen a lot of real rifles that someone's changed and put number 10 sights on. That's not true. Uh, the Marines never used the number 10 sights on these rifles. It just was the fact that they showed up in Brophy's book the first time and everybody that was humping their rifles added them. So uh, that's the first thing. If you got number 10 sights on your rifle, it's so wrong. Um, but as, uh, as I was saying, this one is the special target. Uh, the national match uh, is just a standard national match. It would still have its star cage barrel. Uh, but... Um, But as I was saying, there's two different variations. There's a special target and the national match. The national match will be uh, basically an original national match rifle that they've cut the handguard and added the scope. The special target is going to be just a national match that they've rebarreled by the Marines at the Philadelphia Depot, uh, and it's just replacement barrel. Uh, once the Marines sit there and rebarreled a national match, it was no longer used by the Marine team. They actually were used in um, marine competitions, all marine competitions, like the Elliott Cup. So even though they were still used in a match configuration, they weren't used by the national match teams. Uh, now, if you look at this rifle, you'll notice this is actually a straight stock. Up until I started doing my research, all the books sat there and said they all had C stocks. This is not correct. The first rifles they actually mounted the scopes on in January 1943. And basically what they did is they took national match rifles and they sat there and cut the handguard, they blued the bolt, and then added the blocks. Whatever stock that was on the rifle was on the rifle when it became a sniper. 
Uh, now, they did sit there and say a few months later in May 1943 that the sea stock was better on it. So they'd give a directive saying that, you know, the stock should be changed to a sea stock if they had them available. But there has actually been a lot that we found now with straight stocks. And there is pictures of them used in combat in World War II with straight stocks. Uh, in fact, there's one that's on uh, Okinawa where there's two straight stock snipers uh, side by side. Um, now just to give you a look at this rifle, um, this one is pretty beat up. Uh, this one is not one of the pristine ones. In fact, I would probably say this is one of the ones that's probably in the worst condition, uh, which actually I sort of like. I think any marine collector likes them sort of salty. Uh, but this rifle's untouched. Uh, now, like I said, when I found it, it didn't have a scope. Uh, they would not have a scope on them. They were released by the Marine Corps without the scope. Uh, in uh, 1953, uh, the Marine Corps sat there and said these rifles were no longer um, basically useful. Well, not useful. They just were outdated. Uh, the whole Marine Corps had switched over to the M1 Grand. Uh, Marines didn't use the O3, uh, except for a sniper capabilities. And the Marines had even sat there and adopted the M1C as their official sniper rifle in uh, November 1950. Uh, so in 1953, they said that, you know, the Marine Corps no longer has a need for these rifles, but they said the scopes they would like to keep. Uh, so it seems like after that, it's sort of a mass exodus. I've encountered several different ways these rifles left the Marine Corps. Um, in fact, it looks like even some were turned over to the Army uh, and sold through the Army uh, through the DCM sales, uh, just as standard service rifles. Um, but... They, uh, they started to leave in 1953, uh, the scopes were held. So because of that, uh, any one of these rifles you find that's real, uh, the scope has probably been added at some point. I've added this one. Uh, in fact, this scope is really neat because uh, it's actually serial number 1775, uh, which if you're a Marine, you don't need any introduction to why that's important, but that's the year the Marine Corps was founded. Uh, so it just seems sort of fitting um, that I actually found um, the inertial scope 1775 because um, it, it's just so cool. Uh, but the scope is actually really salty, uh, which I actually really like. Um, most of these inertial scopes you find, uh, they all look in brand new condition. Uh, they had a huge surplus of them. Uh, like I said, there was only for sure about 250 rifles made. There might have been a few more, but I really, in my personal opinion, don't think there was that many made past that. Uh, in 1951, they talk about that they don't have enough to supply 100 per division, uh, which at that time, the Marine Corps is only two divisions. So, I mean, it, it seems like they're implying that they have less than 200 rifles, um, which could be completely possible. Uh, but they had 1,750 scopes. Uh, so the scopes are actually very plentiful. In fact, I see a lot of scopes. And like I said, most of them look brand new condition. So to see a scope that's actually pretty salty, um, I was actually really pumped to find because uh, you don't find them salty. Uh, and to have a rifle that's so beat up and have a mint looking scope on it, it looks off. So I was really excited to find this one because it's salty and then just the serial number of it just, you know, just really was really cool. Uh, just to give you a better look at the scope, um, I'm not sure how that clear shows up. Uh, I've tried to actually uh, whiten those markings a little bit so people can read them. Um, but they just say J. Inertle, USMC Sniper, 1775. And on that adjustment ring, there's an 8 for 8 power. Um, the scope is roughly about 24 inches long. Um, it does not have a spring on it like you see on uh, a lot of the Inertle scopes. Uh, when the Marine Corps sit there and was looking at it and they had this, the spring on it, the, um, the scope would actually sit there and because of the 30 cal recoil would actually sit there and could potentially break it. Uh, it definitely was uh, sitting there really hard on the crosshairs. Um, but it's just basically a, a one and one quarter inch inertial target scope. Uh, they actually sit there and made some commercial ones like this. Uh, they weren't entirely all Marine Corps, but the Marine Corps ones will be marked USMC Sniper. Um, looking at the rifle from this side, 
Um, this rifle started out as, it, it's sort of hard to tell, it's serial number 149, uh, which it could have been a 35 or a 1936 national match. The Marine Corps did get uh, national matches in 35 and 36, and one year was 100, the other year was 150. I can't remember off the top of my head which year was what, but this rifle could have fallen into either one of those shipments. Um, and uh, when it initially was shipped, uh, it did not have uh, the hatcher hole, what you guys know as the hatcher hole, uh, even though we now realize that Hatcher had absolutely nothing to do with that hole. Uh, it was actually a guy named uh, Borden, a Lieutenant Colonel Borden, who came up uh, and got it approved in 19, well, December 1936. So how we all call that a Hatcher hole, Hatcher had nothing to do with that. I have the documents to back it up. Um, but looking at the rifle, uh, like I said, it was a 35-36 national match. It wouldn't have had what I call now the Borden hole. It wouldn't have the Borden hole, so the Marines drilled that. Um, and it does have uh, a 438 barrel date, which I don't know if you guys can read that or not. Um, but that's actually a common barrel that you see on the Marine Corps Special Target rifles that were built into sniper rifles. Uh, you see a lot of early 40, uh, I'm sorry, a lot of 38 barrel dates. Uh, if you remove that handguard, you will see the Marine Corps vice marks on the barrel. Uh, in fact, this is a way that I tell a special target is real um, because they were all changed on the same barrel vise. And it's actually almost like CSI. You can take the barrel markings, the grooves, and actually you can superimpose them over each other and you can tell it's the same identical tool that changed all these barrels on these sniper rifles. Um, and uh, starting in the fall of 38, uh, they started drilling the hatcher holes, uh, well, the Borden holes, and the receivers as well. Uh, so this barrel date, it's hard to know exactly when it was changed. Um, my personal gut feeling is probably at the end of the, the 1940 season, uh, and it was changed into this 38 barrel date, which is the last year the Marines had got barrels to that point. Uh, and then they drilled the hatch, uh, the board and hole on top of it, uh, and then it has the barrel vice marks. Um, but there's really no way to tell. Uh, so far, Every replacement barrel I've seen on a, inertal, a real inertal sniper rifle has either been a 38 barrel date or I've seen just a few of uh, real early 41 Sedgley barrels. I think I've seen two now. Uh, and I do see a way in the documents that you could have had a Sedgley barrel on one of these rifles, um, a 41 date. I would be very, very, I, I would have a hard time believing a 42 date uh, Sedgley, uh, and even a 41, it's, it would be extremely rare. Uh, and you'd have to have something else on the rifle to prove that, that it's real by the traits, um, because it was not something that was common. Um, but looking down the stock, uh, the one thing that I always thought that was really neat on this one, uh, it looks like almost someone was carving <laughs> notches in there. And, uh, usually I'm someone who, doesn't believe in that stuff but looking at these these things are old and i could see a sniper doing that uh, and then like i said the general outlook of the rifle is one has been fielded this thing has been drugged behind a truck almost uh, and so and there might be some truth now whether or not a gentleman was shooting deer with it in the 50s and he marked his kills for that i don't know but i, I don't think it's fake how i found this rifle i, I don't think anything's fake on it um but it does have um, what they call the, the national match butt plate, even though it was not um, not completely just for national match. Uh, there was just a change by Springfield Armory in the 20s. Uh, it's just they didn't make very many new rifles after 1920s. In fact, 27 was last year. They made service rifles, standard service rifles. So even though they call it a national match butt plate, it's not. It was just on all their new production. Um, to give you a better look at the rifle, I went ahead and removed the scope. Um, like I said, this rifle's never been touched. This one is as original as I think there is about out there. Uh, in fact, this one has some things that are done to it that there's no one out there that knows about. And uh, I found in the documents and it has it done to it. And there's some things I won't tell, just I reserve to 
hold a few things back that when I find rifles, because I mean, when it comes down to it, it's serial number and traits. Um, there could be a potential someone could fake a real rifle, but you would have to be so good. Uh, and I don't know if there's anybody out there that's good enough uh, to get one to really fake and pass. Now, what gets hard is if these rifles have been sporterized at all, which is very common. Uh, I've seen, I don't know, I've seen quite a few that I think were sporterized and someone restored. And they re try to restore it to what a book says. And like I said, you can't trust the books right now. They're not very good. Um, so I would just, you got to be careful. But there are some things that I'm not going to talk about. Um, but first, you know, um, look at the handguard. Um, there was only one style of handguard. I know the books say there was multiple styles. That's crap. Uh, when you get real rifles that have never been messed with and you put the handguard side by side, they're all cut the exact same way. Uh, in fact, they even have a flaw cut into them that I found on every one I've seen. Uh, so how the books say there was multiple different styles and all that stuff, they're just full of crap. Um, it just wasn't right. Um, but you get the handguard, you get the front blocks. Uh, the blocks are a nurdle, uh, O and E. Um, the, the rear block is just pushed up against the rear sight base, um, just drilled and tapped. Uh, looking at the top of the bolt, you can see where it's been electro penciled with the serial number. Uh, the serial number is on this one. Uh, let me turn the rifle around so you can get a little bit better look at it. But this was just a, a national match bolt uh, from when the rifle was new. Uh, the Marine Corps actually blued all the bright polished bolts on these. Again, that's another thing that, that you will see in the books. The books will sit there and say that all these rifles could have had a bright blue polished bolt and still be a sniper rifle. This is not true. Uh, the Marine Corps, uh, six months before they built or first before they mounted the first scope on these rifle rifles. Um, gave an order to blue every national match bolt they had in inventory. So they blew them. But the thing about it is, is how you can look in this video and it still looks polished or whatever. That's because the finish, they didn't rough up the bolts. They just blew them. And so it almost becomes like a watery, transparent blue. And when you get under light, it still looks polished. But when you get it out of the light, it still looks blued. It, it's the only bolt that you'll ever see on uh, a military rifle like this. And it just has to do with the fact that they were a national match polished bolt that had been blued. Um, but I'm gonna turn the rifle around and show you a little bit more of this bolt. Okay, there's the bolt. Um, now, like I said, in here, in this video, it actually probably is gonna look to you like it's polished uh, and not blued, but it actually is blued. Um, in fact, it's completely blued. And when you get it in different lights, it actually changes color. Um, but it's electro penciled with the serial number of the rifle, the 145-9600. Uh, and when I change the different angles, uh, you'll be able to tell that it's blued. Uh, and when I pull the bolt out, you can really tell. Hold on one sec. When I get it directly out of the light, you can really tell that that bolt is blued. Uh, and the whole thing is blued. Um, but like I said, you get it underneath light, and it, it looks like it's transparent. Uh, and that's what... I mean, if you look at that, that, that looks like it's polished and it's still bright. And that's why some of the Marine Corps pictures uh, look like they have bright polished bolts. They don't. It's just the funky way that they finish them. Uh, but this is a sign of a real rifle. A polished bolt that's done by Springfield Armory uh, that the Marine Corps blewed in 1942. And like I said, they blewed them all. So anybody gives you a sniper rifle, says that uh, it didn't have a blued bolt, uh, that rifle has either had its bolt changed post Marine Corps when they built them or the rifle's a fake. Um, looking at the rifle, uh, more, uh, it's a national, it was a national match, rebarreled by the Marine Corps, became a special target, um, but you can see the rails have been polished. Uh, and that's just a national match feature. Um, so, I mean, the rails are polished, the follower has been polished, uh, everything in there has been polished to sit there and do rapid fire in the national matches. And that's just a national match trait. Um, now, this is interesting, and this is something that I figured out early on. 
is the Marine Corps actually bedded these stocks. Uh, this was not a sniper part or a sniper conversion. Um, this was actually when it was a team rifle. So this stock was on this rifle when it was a team rifle. And what it said was the, the Marine team had trouble with the, the stock touching on the sides right there and right there. And so what they would do is it would cause erratic shots. So they actually sit there and filed a little bit of that away uh, to give it a little bit of a gap so it didn't touch it. They also sat there and rubbed a lot of linseed oil, uh, raw linseed oil in the stocks uh, to give them waterproofing because these were just match guns. I mean, they were using them in competitions trying to beat the army and everyone else. Uh, so they would sit there and do a coat of uh, like linseed oil and some documents say they did it every night. Um, the sight, I don't know if you guys can tell just because this rifle's so beat up uh, and doesn't have a lot of finish left. Uh, but the rear sight is actually a bright face sight and has the 27, uh, 2,750 yard notch. Um, the Marine Corps actually took off the national match sights and put on an earlier bright face sight um, because they would actually sit there and take a smoke pot and they would sit there and smoke the rear sight and then wipe it clean and it would leave the graduations on the sight in the black. It made it easier for them to read while they were in competition. They also sit there and would use different apertures that they would um, uh, zero to the shooter. So there were apertures that had holes drilled to different left or right angles. Uh, so they would actually zero the aperture to the shooter and not use the windage to sit there and zero it to the shooter. Uh, and that's why when you see in these books where they have all changed over to number 10 sites, it's a shame because they probably took out the original Marine Corps uh, aperture where they sit there and custom to, to the shooter and they got rid of it just because some book told them that number sites was correct which it's not um, but just give you a little bit better look at that hand guard uh, you can see the age to it and how they cut it um, and I actually took it to I took it to one of the uh, machine shop producers at Purdue University and had him like sort of reverse engineer it just because I was trying to figure out how the Marine Corps did it. Uh, he thought they used a horizontal mill with a three inch cutter. Um, but like I said, all the hand guards are the same. There is no variation. It's a World War II replacement hand guard that they cut. Um, a lot of times the hole in the center for the, um, the block is just taken out with like, what it looks like as a file. Um, these rifles, even though the you know you, we think of sniper rifles today as being so um, I don't know like precision and and everything, these rifles there is some variation to them as far as um, they weren't mass produced, uh, and, and then also they stayed around in Marine Corps use from 1943 all the way into 53, and Marines are hard on rifles, so they, I mean you'll see parts change here and there. Uh, I wouldn't worry so much about that. It's just part of the use of the rifle, but um, they they weren't mass produced, so there's just a tiny bit of variation. But the thing is, when you look at them, they're they're all still the same. It's just it just takes a trained eye. Um, but looking at it a little bit more, uh, like I said, to the barrel. What's interesting about this one? Um, if you look at that front sight. Uh, it was actually a taller front sight, and it ain't going to show up in the video, but they actually sit there and filed them down to change the height. And again, this was another thing they did for Marine Corps team shooters. So the sight that's on there probably was the one that was on when it was a team rifle. Uh, they filed it down to sit there and zero it to the shooter who was shooting it. Um, later on, the Marine Corps actually had different height blades that they used, but this one, like I said, this one's just been filed down. Uh, you can also see some remnants of like white paint on there. Uh, at one time, I think it was painted white, so you know, and sit there and contrast with a, a black bullseye. Um, just giving you a shot of the rifle again. Um, another shot of the bolt and the electro pencil on there. Um, this one originally. Uh, wouldn't have had that enlarged hole. Uh, it's a, it's an NS bolt, but when this one came out, they didn't have the enlarged hole. They had a small one. Uh, the Marine Corps actually enlarged that hole in the bolt. Um, some of the, the 37 dates, you actually see a second hole uh, added instead of 
uh, single hole enlarged. Um, actually, that's something I should probably touch on. Um, even though, um, you know, you see wide serial ranges as they talk about were used. Uh, the two most common serial ranges we find on these rifles are the 1496s and the 1526s. Those are, I'd say, at least a half to three quarters of the rifles that I know of. Um, the Marine Corps got the last two shipments in 1937 and 1940. Each shipment was 150 national match rifles. So probably because they were the last ones used, those were the ones uh, that were in the best condition. So those were the first ones that were converted to snipers. Um, you do see some earlier ones, like this one's a 145. I, I think the earliest one that I've seen that's still um, not really messed with is a 140. I, I, and I do know of one gentleman who has a 125 that looks like it might have been an inertal sniper at one time, but it, the rifle's been rebuilt. Um, and after the, they've been rebuilt, which didn't happen very often, but after they've been rebuilt, um, it makes it harder to uh, distinguish if it's a real rifle or not. Uh, part of the way that we identify these rifles is by the bolt and the handguard, um, because those are so distinct to these rifles and they're hard to replicate and reproduce. Well, in rebuild, um, it looked like his bolt had been blued and his handguard had been lost. So, you know, it, it just becomes, yeah, the holes match up and stuff, and it probably was a national match, but it's hard to say if it was an internal sniper. That that watery blued finish on that bolt and the way that handguard is cut is the two quickest ways that we can match up these rifles. There's some internal mods. Uh, done. I, I'm not going to go into that. Like I said, I'm not going to help, you know, I'm not going to tell everything I know. Um, but I mean, generally you give me pictures of a rifle and you're trying to document it as real. I'm going to look at that bolt and I'm going to look at that hand guard and I'm going to look at that serial number and I'm going to look at the barrel date. Those four things will tell me right then and there within probably 95%, 97%, um, accuracy of whether the rifle is real or not, because the humpers don't know how to do the bolts right yet, thank God. They don't know how to do the handguards correct, thank God. Um, they just, they, I'm sure they'll get better. I've put out way too much info, probably more than I should, but um, I also don't like seeing people spend $40,000 on a rifle from a book and the rifle is completely fake. Um, so, you know, I, I've seen way too many inertal sniper rifles sold um, because someone's name is attached to it and the rifles aren't real, um, uh, which is just heartbreaking when I get a guy who writes me an email and he wants me to authenticate a rifle for him. And I just start detailing on there why it's not, and then showing in the documents from the Marine Corps why it's not. Um, so I, I have tried to, in the last, you know, eight years or so, get the record straight on these rifles so that way people don't get taken. Um, because these these rifles sell for a lot, so um, I I don't want to see anybody get taken. Um, but uh, these uh, these have you know are pretty rare. Like I said, I know of about maybe thirty thirty five. Uh, I do have a second one that's a national match variant with the C stock. It's from the nineteen thirty seven shipment. Um, and then, you know, I have a lot of friends that have them now that we sort of built a little club. Uh, if you think you have one of these rifles that's real, uh, please reach out to me. Uh, I'll put my email address at the bottom of this. I do authenticate these for people. Uh, also, if you have a real rifle, I have a club that I will uh, get you involved in where we all have pictures of our rifles. Uh, so, you know, there's 30 or 40 of us or whatever. And we all have probably 50 or 75 pictures of our rifles. You can get in there and look at them, and you can just tell how all these rifles are the same uh, as far as same traits, same features. The bolts are the same. Handguards are the same. Um, so, I mean, except for small variances, like sometimes someone will have a follower spring replaced, or, you know, you do see different stocks on them just because stocks are changed. Um, but, you know, for the most part, these things are all identical, and, and that, that's information that I'll make you privy to if you do have a real rifle. Um, you know, I, I do like to sit there and keep track of where all the real rifles are. Uh, so if you do have one, I do appreciate, you know, let me know and, and I'll, you know, 
tell you what I think of it. Um, but if you guys have any questions on this, please ask. Uh, I'll do my best to answer them. Um, I just thought you guys might appreciate seeing a video of a real rifle instead of a clone. Um, thanks for watching, and uh, if you guys like this video, I have almost every variant of sniper rifle, and I have a lot of documents.